I would like to read in John's Gospel, please. And we're going to read an expression, it's foreign expression, that I'm reading these verses. And John chapter 17. <clears throat> and we'll just read the expression that I want. 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. This expression, thy word is truth. Now, verse number, go back a little, and verse number <clears throat> four. I have finished the work which thou givest me to do. Now back to John 6, please. <clears throat> For a well-known text on verse number 37. <clears throat> All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. And back to the verse in chapter 3 for a final verse. It has been quoted already in the gospel. Verse number 36 of John 3. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see light, but the wrath of God <coughs> abideth on him. That's all we'll read, and I trust God will help me to commence this meeting on very simple truth. You know, we're living in a world that's a world of change. And I don't need to go into a detailed dialogue with you tonight as to a changing world. As to changing values. But I want to read, I want to look at four definite expressions here, and they are unchanging. We want to look at the word that is unchanging. In fact, John's gospel, one of the themes in this lovely gospel is the theme of the word of God. And I want to look at the word that never changes. Then, secondly, I want to think of the work. That never changes. Its value still is the same as what it was when he finished the work upon the cross. It has eternal value, the work of Christ. I want to think of the welcome that is unchanging. That is, him that cometh to me, said Christ, I will in no wise cast out. Where there is an honest, seeking, repentant, Last sinner, even in this meeting tonight, we want to tell you emphatically, compassionately, tenderly, faithfully that Christ will receive you. He welcomes. Another thing that doesn't change is the wrath of God. That ab abides upon everyone, the impending doom of the unconverted. My friend, if they die without Christ, would that God would help me to feel it in tender tones. The wrath is unchanging. The word of God, we don't need to make any apology for the word of God. We don't need even to defend it. It defends itself in all its absolute authority. The word of God is authoritative. We have a great book, and in this book, and where I've read, thy word is truth. I just want to pick up the expression, thy word is truth. It's something that you can rely upon. It has the stamp of God upon it. We can absolutely be assured that what we are preaching tonight and what you're listening to has the stamp of God upon it. It's authoritative. It's, a, it's infallible. It's indispensable. It's life-giving, it's potent, it's powerful. The Word of God, 
Hebrews chapter 4 tells us the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. All we need tonight, it's not great preaching, but what we need is one word to be etched with divine power upon the conscience of a soul. And my friend, it would do its tremendous work tonight in your heart and conscience that would lead you to Christ himself. Thank God for the naked power of the word of God. Many a soul I have heard tell how they got saved and when they got saved and where they got saved. And it's amazing what scriptures were used from the word of God to first reach their conscience. Many a man traveling along the highway saw painted upon a granite, uh, a granite stone or a rock. Eternity where? And it lodged deep within his heart. And that word only found once in our Bible, found in Isaiah chapter 57, eternity, the high and lofty one that inhabited eternity. One word, my friend, caused the conscience to be disturbed. Oh, may God speak tonight. That word, sometimes we hear of souls that get saved and maybe uh, painted upon the roof of a barn. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That winged its way home to the conscience and the power of the spirit of God and that soul was awakened to see Christ. The word, my friend, it's unchanging. We have all confidence, not in ourselves, but in the word of God. It comes with all its absolute authority. I remember the night it reached me in the darkness of my sin. My lostness in my guilt. My friend, when I was awakened, the word. Listen to what it says in Peter. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. It's the eternal word, unchangeable. It's reliable. Trust what it says. It's infallible. There's no mistakes in it. It's life-giving. The word that I speak unto thee are life. And my friend, I hope tonight what I have to say as I hurry on, for I want to get to the second one particularly, that this word, I hope it is reaching your heart. I have often wondered, in our present society with all the rush and bustle of earth and the mind so clogged with so many things that now infiltrate I wonder how many leave a gospel meeting as they used to. The first thing they do when they get into their bedroom is to take down the word. Looking for salvation. I wonder, my friend, will there be anyone in this meeting that when this meeting concludes that God has reached your soul by this word that has been preached, the word of the gospel, the word that's reliable, the word, my friend, that's life-giving, the word that's all-powerful, the word that's quick. I hope, my friend, it might reach you tonight because one thing the word of God does, basically, basically, the first thing it does, it awakens a person as to their sin. It brings them very much face-to-face -face with God and reality. That's what the Word of God does. That's why people don't like to read it. That's why they shelve it. That's why dust accumulates on its covers. That's why people will read anything else but the naked, unvarnished Word. Because, friend, this Word has all potency to reach you. Friend, I hope it has reached you tonight. First thing it will do, it will awaken your conscience that I'm not right with God. The word of God will bring you to a recognition. I'm a sinner before God. The word of God will bring you to your lostness. The word of God will bring you to the sense that I need Christ desperately, urgently. And I need him now. That's why I want to bring in the message of the gospel tonight with a background, this word. This word, friend, is absolutely reliable. The work. The work. Thank God, my friend, what we are presenting tonight is a work that's unchanging in its value. It will never change. It will never lose its luster. It will never lose its power. It will always be a monument to God's eternal praise. And heaven will be filled 
with sinners who have rested. They're all upon that finished work. And they're destined for glory to enjoy the bounty and bam of heaven and the bliss of glory. All because of the work that Christ wrought upon the cross. Here he says in John 17, I have in anticipation finished the work which thou givest me to do. That work, my friend, that was given into the hands of the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, was the work to procure redemption, to deal with man's sin, to bear its penalty, to endure its punishment, to pay its debt that man had incurred against God. And at the cross, thank God for the fullness of the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm a very simple preacher, but a strong advocate of the fullness of the work of Christ that can save the whosoever will. Thank God in his great gospel, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And my friend, when Christ on the cross hung yonder in dark Golgotha between two thieves and in the darkness felt the awful tremendous weight and load of man's guilt and sin that fell upon him. He finished the work. All the fullness of it, planted in every island, planted in every community, planted in every part of our world, we can plant the great, victorious, emancipating work of our Lord Jesus as the only way to heaven. After all, the Bible does say it's not of works, lest any man should boast. That work in its fullness. Tell to every saint you meet the sinners, high and low, the value of the Savior's blood that washes white as snow. The work, friend, that he performed. When he said it is finished, then he bowed his head and dismissed his spirit. All was accomplished to God's eternal glory and praise. That work dealt with my sin. That work satisfied a God against whom I had sinned. That work canceled my debt. That work, my friend, satisfies me for eternity. When I left the shores of Ireland 34 years ago, there's a large crowd gathered. I thought it was large for a young couple, my wife and I just married. And uh, as they were there, they sang some hymns as they do. And they shook hands and we embraced each other. But when I got to the deck of the ship, I'll never forget it. I would like the thing just to plunge right out and get out of sight quickly, but that's not the way a ship goes. The plane goes that way. But the ship goes out slowly. There's a dear brother from Donna, Dollingstown. He shouted up as he cupped his hands to his mouth. He says, Albert, give them the gospel. <laughs> and I was trembling like a leaf. I thought I was getting out free. Oh, my friend, as I looked at the crowd and then all those executives, their wives saying goodbye to them or, or their children and the whole crowd that's on the pier. And what am I going to do standing beside my young bride? I was more thinking of giving her a hug, just married, than preaching the gospel. But my friend, when he cupped up and said, preach the gospel, Albert. And I remember saying, as the old preacher said, when you're stuck, just quote the scriptures. That's what they tell you in the open air, no lectures. Just preach the scriptures. And I preach that grand, glorious, soul-thrilling, unrivaled, unparalleled verse from the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I just quoted it when flashing into my soul. I believe the Spirit of God did that. Come the words of Horatia Boner that I love. Upon a life I did not live. Upon a death I did not die. Upon another's life and death I stake my whole eternity. My th friend tonight in the meeting, I think I could have preached for an hour. Once I started, they could hardly get me stopped. Oh, my friend, oh, the ruling power of that message, friend, that comes from heaven with all its authority and compassion. The work is finished. Oh, the fullness of it. 
If you die in your sins and land eternally away from God in the darkness of despair and the anguish of your soul forever, you'll never, never, never blame that great monumental work wrought at the cross that will fill heaven with souls forever. Not only the fullness of it, the freeness of it, it stands in contradiction to man trying to do anything. There are people brought up in our gospel halls and they think there are nine steps to salvation or seven steps or five steps or three steps. My friend, the Bible is absolutely clear as crystal. When Christ cried, it is finished. That satisfies God and it satisfies a sinner like me. I rest where God has eternally rested. I rely upon a work that cannot fail. I give God the credit for telling the truth that a son took my place. That's what happened to me in the roadside. In a little, side a little hut almost, as I passed up the road in the darkness of my sin, groping for it, wondering how I was going to get it, looking for believing trying to work it up and trying to work up faith and trying to work up even visualizing Christ on the cross and trying to believe every step I took and my friend the darker I became until at that little hut two men I thought afterwards they were Spurgeon and Whitfield if I told you their names you would smile when I went in and heard them the next night one brother said to the other, open the windows, there might be Sunday passing, there's no one here to preach to. And I was passing, oh my friend, I was passing, and I heard words that were sung by those folk, I thought there was a real heavenly choir. Really wasn't, there was just about nine voices croaking. And they were trying to sing out, but I thought it was thrilling to my heart when I heard it, Christ receive a sinful man. Even me with all my sin purged from every spot and stain. Heaven with him I'll enter in, sing it o'er and o'er again. Christ receive a sinful man. I wasn't saved at that moment, but one thing I learned. At that moment when that hymn was being sung and I listened to the very last verse of that hymn, my friend, one thing that lodged deep in my mind. Yes, Christ does receive sinners because I know those that are going to heaven. But how do I know you've received me? And I learned, just as I've quoted this text, on the roadside an hour later between two pillars leading to an old schoolhouse, I learned this lesson very simply in my darkness. Oh God, I can't see it. I'm lost. I'm going to hell. Albert, the hear it's just so simple as I talk. Albert, the work of Christ not enough. Let me die for you. No sooner had that come into my soul than those words come before me. Jesus said, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. I said, thank God he died for me. I'll never be in hell. The work is completed. God is satisfied. Oh, my friend, the soul thrilling moment of knowing my sins are gone. My fears are over. The work has satisfied God oh the freeness of it I'll tell you something the finality of it there's no other work you'll search you'll try you'll try to plumb the depths of it you'll try to put it together like a jigsaw puzzle but my friend you'll come in your desperation to where every one of us came Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress. Helpless look to thee for rest. Thy lie to the fountain fly. Cleanse me, Savior, or I die. You know, there's nothing like the simplicity of preaching that great, grand, glittering, unparalleled work of the Lord Jesus all oh, the fullness of it heaven's going to be filled to capacity from every country every time I meet people from a foreign land I'm always thrilled who are saved I don't know it does something for me I meet my brethren from Ireland but I know they're Irish so we get used to each other 
But you know, when I meet folk from Malaysia or from China or some other part, my heart is always thrilled to the very depths. Saved! All because of the same work that Christ wrought upon the cross. I told them at Langstaff there recently. Dear girl there, she's a, a Muslim from Iran. Just got saved two years ago. She come to me in tears after a ministry meeting. She said, Mr. Hall, she said, you know, my dad and mum have disowned me. They want me back into Iran, but I dare not go. She said, pray for me. And the reason why she said that, she said, because my uncle in Indianapolis keeps in touch with me by phone and he's coming to visit while the meetings are going on in Langstaff. He's a Muslim and his wife is Muslim. She said, it would be a wonderful thing, but I don't know whether it would ever happen. I'd love to see him under the canvas roof in the tent. Well, I said, God is able. That's all I can say. Of course, sometimes we can use that as a quip. Well, she met her, her uncle and his wife at the plane, and instead of going home, brought them right to the tent. <laughs> Sitting in the seat, I'll never forget, not saved yet, but pray for them. And I'll never forget as he sat there, this Muslim and his wife, the two of them, listened attentively to the gospel. I think you could have preached if there were only two in the building or in the tent. They just sat and listened. And John 3, 16, 11, it was behind me. Good text behind you, no matter where you're preaching. And I said this statement. I don't often say it, but I said, I don't want anyone to leave this hall that cannot quote John 3, 16 without looking at it. I don't want them to be able to quote it without even looking at it, whether in the, on the wall or your Bible. So going out is the 150 filed out, and I'm going a minimum. And as they were filing out, this Muslim man come to me with a strong grip, well-built Muslim gentleman. He said, that's a good text. I said, yes, the best you could ever read. I said, can you quote it? He says, I can. I think I can, he said. I said, you can't, without looking at it. And the people were coming. I said, quote it right here to me. Boy, I was thrilled to hear him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I said, good. I said, never knew it before, never. And he said to his dear little niece, he come the second night, then going home in Indianapolis. He looked at the wall in the little apartment, and there's John 3.16. He said, my dear, he said, could I, could I, could I have that text? And she went over to the wall and pulled it down and handed it into his hands and said, yes, uncle, you can have the text freely. Pray that God will etch it upon his soul, the work of Christ. It reached that man. I sent him a Bible. The woman said, what way do you want it to go? Do you want it to go by, you know, ordinary mail? Or I says, what's the difference in price? <laughs> she said, well, you know, it's, it's one of those big Bibles. She said, five dollars and something for just the ordinary. I says, what is it by error to get it immediately? Twenty-eight dollars. I says, I'll buy it. Twenty-eight dollars. Here's for the stamp. Best investment. Get it there quick. The life-giving word with all its potency and power. The finality of that work. There's not going to be another. It is finished, settled forever. Never to be repeated. You know, friend, there might be someone tonight say, well, I agree, the word of God is true. It tells me I'm a sinner. I'm lost. I'm without hope. I'm without God. If I die as I am, I'll be lost. And the work of Christ, it seems very clear that he has satisfied God. Sin has been dealt with. Redemption procured. Christ is living. But I would like to know how. Listen, friend, there's a welcome tonight. And I want to tell you, him that cometh, said Christ, to me, I will in no wise cast out. Never did I meet a sinner. Honest before God, desiring to be saved, wanting to know Christ. Did Christ ever turn a sinner away? Never, never. 
Many a boy has been turned away from his home because of rebellion. Many a person has been rejected because of some outlandish thing they've done in life. But my friend, I don't care how dark, how sinful, how guilty, how vile. That sinner that comes in their sin and need and lostness to Christ. You know something? He loves to welcome you. Never turn you out. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. My friend, that promise stands valid tonight as it did when it was spoken. And many a soul, Spurgeon said, he would like to hang a thousand souls upon that promise of Christ. Him that cometh to me. Listen, friend, you don't come with your feet. You come with your heart. That's why you don't have to come to the front of a building. It's the heart's response to Christ, friend. Is he calling you? Is anyone hearing his voice tonight? Did you see your sin and your need and your condition before God? And did you like to know absolutely, desperately, and urgently that my sins are forgiven, canceled? Listen, the Savior says tonight from heaven, him, he said it on earth, but he's saying it tonight from this great book. Him that cometh, I will in no wise cast out. You know, friend, when we get to the glory land, you know who we're going to meet? We're going to meet billions. And I'm going to put it in words, and you mightn't believe me, trillions. You know why they're there? I'll tell you why they're there. The only reason. When they came to the Lord Jesus, he took them in. Didn't cast them out, he received them. Just as I was, he received me, seeking from judgment to flee. Now there is no condemnation. Christ is the Savior for me. And I, Whitfield, excuse me for borrowing them. I preach them all the time. Some of the sayings. When that outside ring of 30,000 people listening to that great voice preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, pointing men to the Savior, touching the consciences of men, unfolding the future. There were two outcasts who came to listen to the Whitfield preach. They wouldn't mingle with the rest. They were in the perimeter. And Whitfield said in that voice, by the help of God, as he peeled out the gospel, he says, remember that Christ would even receive the devil's castaways. Some of the theologians didn't like it. Said to Whitfield, did you not go too far? Where do you get that in the book? Devil's castaways. The dear Whitfield pulled out of his pocket a piece of paper, crinkled. He says, let me read this to you. Mr. Whitfield, we come to this open air meeting to hear you but we thought within ourselves the devil wouldn't even take us. We're so far degraded in our sin. But when you quote it, when Christ died, he died to save sinners and he would even receive the devil's castaways. We just trusted him. Oh, my friend, thank God the welcome is there extended to the whosoever will. Let me close with this in good time. The word. It's reliability, absolute confidence in it, the work and its fullness and freeness and finality. The welcome, my friend, is extended to all. The wrath is unchanging, and I'm not going to shout one word when I say it. There are folk in this meeting, and if you died, whether tonight or within the near future, in your present condition you would be in wrath unchangeable and I can't listen I can't expose it or explain or expound it you take every scripture in the Bible that speaks of it and bring it all together in capsule form well can't my friend come near to the reality the nearest I can come to the wrath of God in its absolute reality is this. While I look at the cross, 
Thy wrath lieth hard upon me. My friends, sinners, I don't listen, brought up in Christian homes, cradled in the gospel, loved compassionately, longed for, prayed for, brethren met in the hall here at this side, and they prayed that God would save souls in this meeting. Those brought up in Christian homes, those who have maybe just come in, and we welcome you from our hearts. The cry is this, O oh God, visit us with thy salvation. Because listen, friend, impending doom lies upon every Christ rejecter. It hasn't been executed. It's still hanging over, hovering like a mighty billow, like a mighty storm. It hasn't broke in its fury and dread reality. But my friend, once that sinner passes into eternity, wrath. Darkness that can never be penetrated. Night that knows no morning, sunrise. Waves that know no abating. Sorrows that know no end. Tears that know no wiping away. Endless doom. God help us tonight. Hope I'm not playing with it. And I hope you're not. We're going to leave very shortly. Shake your hand. Appreciate your coming. But friend, if you died in your sins, you had been a place where wrath would be unchanging for all eternity. Never. Never. To know any change. God loves you tonight. And as this gospel is preached before the meeting, may you trust Christ tonight. Now, shall we turn to the book of the Acts, please? <coughs> Chapter 8. The book of the Acts, Chapter 8. We'll commence our reading at verse 25. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he rose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning, and sitting in his chariot read Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near, and join thyself <coughs> to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearers so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. 
But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Now the Lord will bless to us the reading of his own precious word. For some considerable time, I have been emphasizing in the preaching of the gospel the foundation that was laid and is reported for us in the four gospels, the foundation of all our preaching of the gospel. The Savior, when he was risen from the dead, if we take Luke's account of the commission, he said that it behoved Christ to suffer and that he should be the first that would rise from the dead and that repentance and the forgiveness of sins would be preached in his name among all the nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And so when we come to the four Gospels, we have the account of the foundation of the Gospel, the death of our Lord Jesus upon the cross, his glorious resurrection, and the commission that he made, sending men into the world to preach repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. But when we leave the four Gospels, we come to the greatest book as far as the preaching of the gospel is concerned. It's the book that all men who preach the gospel should read and see how men in early days, at the beginning of the age, how they preached the gospel, how they set it out, and what was the theme of their message. And it might surprise us to find that what we listen to from time to time is not the gospel at all that those men preached in the book of the Acts. I've always been emphasizing to men that are interested in the gospel that we must preach it according to the pattern laid down in the word of God. And so when we come to the book of the Acts, we have the idea of spreading the gospel. They began at Jerusalem, they reached to Samaria, and they went to the uttermost parts of the earth, and they preached the gospel concerning the death and the burial and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so we have then the plan of the preaching. When we come to the epistle to the Romans, we find out the doctrine of the gospel. When I was a young man, I attended Bible readings that Mr. Vine had, and it was on the epistle to the Romans. And I remember he said that no man that preaches the gospel should ever stand upon a platform until he had a working knowledge of the epistle to the Romans. And I remember going home and saying, I shouldn't be preaching at all, for I haven't a working knowledge of the epistle to the Romans. And so I sat down, especially the first five chapters, and I began to read and assimilate the doctrines of the gospel, what it means to be justified, and how it comes about, and how redemption was purchased by the Savior, on how man is ruined, totally ruined, the whole world guilty before God, and that God desires men to receive the gift of salvation. Now I'm going to speak of one of the wonderful conversions. We have heard about that man from Iran that came and heard the gospel, and no doubt God can use his word. And I want to speak here about the conversion of this Ethiopian chancellor for a few minutes this evening. Now you'll find in these chapters 8, 9, and 10 that the gospel is reaching out to the whole wide world. Here we have a son of Ham. If we come to chapter 9, we have a son of Shem. If we come to chapter 10, we have a son of Japheth. And we see that the whole world is included in the preaching of the gospel. We have a man converted from Africa, a man converted from Judaism, and a man converted, the centurion of the Italian band, a European. And in every case, we see how God worked in a similar way while the circumstances were different, but the finality of it was this, that each one of these three men came into contact with the Savior. We remember that the eunuch we're going to see, he received Christ through the preaching of Isaiah 53. And then the apostle without a preacher at all, the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecuted. And then in the house of Cornelius, Peter preached how salvation was purchased by the Lord Jesus and that remission of sins was offered to all that believe on his name. So we have the conversions. Now I want to look at this wonderful story here in Acts 8 as a plan, and it shows how God works. And first of all, I want to show that behind the scenes there was an invisible movement, the Spirit of God. It's very interesting to see how the Spirit of God is working with a man, 
because the Spirit of God began to work upon the heart of this Ethiopian chancellor who had charge of all the treasure of Queen Candace. He's a man that had reached the top rung on the ladder of notoriety and fame and position and affluence, a man with a trust, a man who was given a wonderful position in the kingdom of Queen Candace. And yet with all his treasure, and all the honor was heaped upon him and the responsibilities and how business had prospered in his hand. He felt something lacking in his life. Something was missing in his life. You know, this is not so often preached. The Spirit of God began to move behind the scenes upon this man. And you know, all the preaching that we can do, and we can preach our head off as much as we like. But unless the Spirit of God prepares soil, unless the Spirit of God deals with people and brings them, whenever I preach, I ask God to bring people in that are concerned about salvation. Someone that has an interest in being saved. In fact, the last time I preached this wonderful X8 was because a brother rang me up and he said, I have done business with a man. He's a very wealthy man. He's a Catholic man. He has never heard the gospel, as far as I know. But he's interested to come and hear you. He's a man that has a clean life. And he's a man that would be searching for truth. And he wants to come and hear the gospel. And I wondered what I would preach about. And I thought I'd preach on Acts chapter 8 when this man comes. And sure enough, he was there. And I preached this message that I'm preaching here tonight. How that... This man had everything as far as the world was concerned, but he had a lacking in his heart. He was after something, and that that he was after he found through the preaching of the gospel. And going out, I looked at this man, I shook hands with him. He said, I enjoyed you, very good speaker, he said, but he wasn't interested at all. The other brother went home and drank coffee with him, but he had no response to it. But just as he went out, a young man came in, about 30 years of age, and he said to me, I'd like to speak to you. And when we got to the front, he said, Do you, did you know me? I said, no, I don't know you at all. Well, he said, I'm like that man you were preaching about. He said, when I got my degree, I couldn't get a job in that office, and I commenced a business of my own. And he said, I've got to the top rung of the ladder as far as my business is concerned. But you know, he said, I have no lasting peace. And I haven't found anything to give me joy, real joy in my soul. And life is a burden to me. And he said, when you were preaching, I realized this message is directly for me. And he said, I would like to receive Christ as my Savior. You know, I had the great joy of seeing that young man saved. God had brought him in. I preached to another man altogether. But here's a man, and the Spirit had moved and brought him in. And when last Christmas came, we had a number of cards came and I said to my wife this is the best card of all and it was this young man who was writing to thank God that he came to hear the message of Acts chapter 8 so you see the spirit of God moves upon people and prepares them and concerns them we can't concern them whenever we realize that we can't concern them that God works and brings people in under the sound of the gospel we had to meet people at a a crossroads at a roundabout in Ireland and uh, we, uh, I pulled up my car and the lady came to lift my wife and take her and this brother came to take me to a conference and I got restless I don't like sitting at a roundabout and I got out and walked up and down and paced around my wife says it not come any quicker I said I wish they would come in time brethren are bad timekeepers didn't come in time and I'm walking about and suddenly the cars are going round and round and this car pulls up right beside me and the man rolled down the window and he said, can you tell me the way to Randallstown? I said, I can tell you the way to Randallstown right down there and you'll be there in 10 minutes. Now this man was the representative of the Irish Tourist Board. He was their chief photographer and he knew all the lanes and villages in Ireland and here he stops. Why? He had a mind block going round that roundabout round 10 times and then he finally pulled up and he asked me the way to Randallstown. So I said to him, he looked out strange at me, and I said, do you know me? No, he says, don't know you. Well, I said, uh, my name is Harold Paisley. Oh, Harold Paisley, he said. 
My wife was converted when she was a little girl in Matches Street when you were preaching the gospel. I said, that's wonderful. Do you know the Lord? No, he says, I don't know the Lord. Well, I said, up the, up the a few miles up here, uh, Mr. Bentley, a, a missionary from Malay and myself, were preaching the gospel in a tent up there. Would you like to come? No, I said, don't think so. Well, I said, what about coming and bring your wife on Friday night? I would like to see what she's like. Well, he said, I'll think it over. But he went away down the road, and he said, I told that man I didn't know the Lord. And it really got into his being. He didn't know the Lord. Prosperous businessman, uh, chief photographer for the Irish Tourist Board, suffering a mind block on a roundabout, a restless preacher getting out. My wife said, she was listening. She says, do you think he'll come? I said, I doubt it very much. But anyway, that's it. Well, you know, he came. You didn't know this. He came on Friday night to hear us in the tent and brought his wife. And so he's sitting in the tent listening to the gospel and uh, he saw a businessman giving out hymn books where he bought his shoes. And he said to his wife, what's he doing here? Well, she says, that's the way the brethren operate. She says, they have laymen doing things. Oh, he says, I see. Well, we went back to Canada and Mr. Bentley went to Malaya and so on. But he left the paper and he saw that this businessman was preaching the gospel. And he said to his wife, you know, I don't know the Lord. And that thing has stuck on me all the time. And everything I do, I can't enjoy life. I enjoy nothing. He says, I must go. So I got a phone call. And the phone call was this, that he had trusted Christ as his savior as a result of that roundabout. Today, he's baptized in the assembly, the brightest man in that meeting today. I went down, had my dinner with him, and, and uh, a great feast they put on and all, and took photographs of everything, had me standing at monuments, I don't know what all. And I said, you know, I'd like to get my photo taken at the roundabout where God spoke to you. Here's how God worked with this unit. And so the Spirit of God has to work, and he works with the preacher as well. To be in the right place, the right night, at the right time. To be given the opportunity and someone comes in, hears the gospel, and realizes this is what I'm after. The Spirit of God moving. As we have in John 16, when the Spirit has come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. They preached the gospel in the power of the Holy Spirit. They relied on the Holy Spirit to do the work. And when the, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, and the Spirit of God is the only one that can awaken a soul, and the Spirit of God is the only one can guide the servant to the right place. And so here we have the Spirit moving. But then we have the sinner seeking. This man, he got restless. And I often use my imagination. He says to the queen, I'm going on a pilgrimage. Where are you going? I'm going to the center of Judaism. It's the capital of the world's religion. It's the only religion God has given man. And I'm going to go on that long journey, probably a thousand miles. Took him a long time, weeks to get there. And he's going to Jerusalem. He's seeking. Doesn't know what it is. He knows nothing about the Spirit of God. He knows nothing about salvation. But he has an empty heart. And he's seeking after something longing for something, wanting to know something. And so he's a seeking sinner coming to Jerusalem. But you know, the open airs were over in Jerusalem. I called Jerusalem the city of the greatest open airs. At every corner they preached. Thousands were saved through the preaching of the gospel in the open airs. That's where I began to preach when I was a boy. I went out to the street corners the first night. There was no open air in our town where I was raised, and I was only a boy of 19. And I said, I'd like to go out and stand at Bryan Street, the corner. And I asked for volunteers to come, and none of them would come. It was a place where old drunkards, and I thought I would get them coming out of the pubs, at least to have somebody to preach to. And I went up there and stood myself. And then by and by the brethren came, and young men came. And we all stood, and we preached John 3 and 16, and... One man had a bungalow out the road. He said, Harold, I heard you preaching two miles out the road. What a fuss you're kicking up on Saturday night. He was away from God. He was a backslider. Although he was in the meeting and all that. 
I said, why don't you come and join us? It's great. We sing hymns and we meet people and we have, we have a great time telling them about the Lord Jesus in the open air. You know, Jerusalem was the center of open airs. There's no open airs now. Everywhere I go, I ask, have you any open air marches? Mr. Bentley and I were talking about those open air marches and every one of us got a banner and we had to march up and down the streets. And the one they gave me was flee from the wrath to come. I wanted mine altered. I wanted John 3 and 16, but you didn't get it until you were older. And the young fellas all got these banners. We marched all around and we preached up and down and people got saved. It was wonderful. In those days of open airs, around all the halls, we had these open air meetings and all the street corners and all the time, all died out. And that was like Jerusalem. Thousands listening to the gospel. But when the eunuch came, there's only the apostles. Whole thing scattered. You know, you got great large assembly, 5,000 believers in Jerusalem. And inside a year, year and a half, there's nobody there. They're all gone. Now we, I remember assemblies where they had 800 children in the Sunday school. 800. We had two sessions, 400, and then 400 again, and then the 4 o'clock meeting, 400 more, and then at night they were queued up to get into the gospel. You know how many is there now? 30. Many children, two dozen. Where are they? It's all changed. Apathy, materialism, troubles, riots, hundreds of things, and places are scattered. And what was once large assemblies? Nobody there. That's what it's like in Jerusalem. Here's a man comes and there's no open air. And there's nobody told him the story of Jesus. There wasn't an apostle there to tell him the way to Calvary. In the city where God had blessed so abundantly. No testimony. Sad, isn't it? But he got the Bible. That's what our brother's man had. He got the scroll, the scriptures. He purchased it. I don't know where he got it. But the Spirit of God had a way to bring that man right up to Jerusalem. And he gets this scroll of the Bible. And now he's going back. The seeking soul is going back. But he has got something with him that he never had before. He's got the scriptures in his hand. Now I was uh, in Paris one time many, many years ago and went to the, the headquarters of the British and Foreign Bible Society and uh, the janitor, he took us up flight after flight. There was Bibles for Poland and for Germany and for all the European countries right up to the rafters. And we went up the rickety stairs of this old building they had. And he says, right up on the roof, there's Bibles everywhere. Coming down, we stopped at what used to be a bedroom. And he says, in that room, it's packed with Bibles, French Bibles. And I said, what's important about it? He said, in that room, the French infidel, Voltaire, who said that France would soon be without a Bible, died raving in that bedroom. And his home became the headquarters of the precious word of God. The Bible is a living book. Thank God for the Bible. Not one of us would ever be saved apart from the Bible. If there's no scripture in your conversion, it's not a, a scriptural conversion. We point people to the way of salvation through the book. The book is the way that tells men how to be saved. Here's a man turning back and he has the book in his hand and he's reading it in the chariot and as he read aloud he's reading in a, the best place that any sinner could possibly read. Whenever I meet a man that wants to be saved I say read Isaiah 53 in your bedroom and go to John 3 and 16 for assurance. Get to John 3 Get to Isaiah 53. Read it for yourself. This man is reading the book. Listen. The spirit moves. The man seeks. The scriptures are in his hand. The servant knows nothing about what's going on out there in that big world. Neither do we. You know there's some businesses that a man may follow. I love to stand sometimes. They don't have them here. But they have butcher shops and iron. They always entrance me. They wear white coats and, and they have funny hats on them like Arabs nearly. Uh, this is Irish butchers. And they're standing there and the dogs are all yapping around wanting beef. 
No, I went in one time into a place there, and uh, the the butcher said to me, "I've just got, I've just got uh, uh, a letter from the lawyer." You see, a dog came in and took one of my beefs away, and I went to this lawyer to claim, and uh, he was a, he was a lawyer that uh, this lawyer's dog that stole the beef. So I went to the lawyer, <laughs> and the lawyer sent him a letter and charged him for the price of the beef and the fee that he had had to get the money back. What a mix-up I never saw in my life. But these butchers, we see them there, and I watch them. I know a man that can cut a round of beef. I watch him. And I know a mechanic that can tell by the sound of the engine. There are some men are going to the car and one tuned up, and they're, uh, they know nothing about an engine. You can see a man that is an expert in his work, whatever he does, he can do it right. But you know, when it comes to the gospel, there's no experts in the gospel. God moves in such ways that we could never define the way he moves. I have seen that over and over again. My long experience. People that you would least expect to ever be saved. You imagine a man taking needles, coming up the stair into a hall for the first time in his life. Listen to the gospel. Says at the door, I want to speak to you. Bows his knee to Christ. Becomes the best man in the assembly today. Where he is. One night. Never heard in his life. Listen to the simple story of Christ. Believe the gospel. What a wonderful thing it is to see people saved. Only God can do it. And we don't know how he works. People imagine they know God is working here and he's working there. And someone's anxious. Not anxious at all. Can't tell by the outward appearance of people. You think you know. Here's a man preaching to hundreds of people, having a successful revival, and suddenly the Spirit of God, angel, the angel of the Lord. Angels are interested in the gospel, can't preach it. I love to sing, Let the Angels Bear the Tidings. Two men came to me and said, that hymn you sing, let the angels bear the tidings. It's not scriptural at all. Shouldn't sing about angels bearing the tidings or another soul forgiven. I said, will you be here tomorrow night? Yes, I hope to attend every night. We'll sing it every night for your benefit. <laughs> I'm one of those who believe that angels linger around a gospel meeting. Always believed it. Sister said to me, I wish my husband was living. To hear about Tom. Got saved in a tent a night. Oh, that my husband was living only to hear it. I said, your husband heard it before you. Angels carried up to heaven and announced his name. Where do you get that in the Bible? Don't get it in the Bible at all, but I use common sense. I believe every time a man is saved, heaven that's announced up there, whether he's from Iran or Iraq, wherever he's from, it's announced in heaven, another soul saved. Let the angels bear the tidings. Did you ever make angels happy? The night I was saved, angels were happy. The whole room was full of them, flying up and down, telling the news. Wonderful. Angels love the gospel. And the angel said to Philip, you leave all this behind. Get away to the desert. And when he got away to that desert, he's waiting to see what's going to happen. He sees this chariot coming along and all a great wealthy man. I'm sure he thought of the Lord's words. How can he that have... Riches enter into the kingdom. Easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. By the way, I don't believe in a little door and a big door. I believe this is an ordinary needle. A camel going through a needle's eye. That's the word that Luke uses, a bellos, which means a needle, an ordinary needle. People talk about a big door. When I went to Jerusalem, I asked, where's the needle's eye? Little door and a big door. No such thing. It's imagination. Preachers preach it all over the world. In every country you go to talk about the needle's eye, little door, and the camel goes down, you, you hit it and you punch it and you take all the drapes off it and you kick it to get it through. No such thing in the Bible as that. Possible. With God, all things are possible. That's what it means. It's impossible for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And it seems impossible for a rich man to go into heaven. But with God, all things are possible. He is a man, a rich man. Plenty of wealth. Here he is. And Philip would say, My, however will this man, will this, is this the candidate? But the Spirit of God said, 
join thyself to this chariot. It's a wonderful thing when you feel in your spirit that you're touching someone for eternity. Touching someone for eternity. And the assembly I'm in fellowship in, I got a phone call one morning from a young man. <laughs> I like these kind of phone calls. He said, oh, Mr. Paisley, I said, yes. He said, I'm sitting in a donut shop at the top of Woodbine Avenue in a corner. And what are you doing there? He says, I'm weeping about my soul. I want you to come. I'll be right up. Felt like a doctor going to operate. I took a little testament with me. I says, I'll see him. I went up and there he was. He drunk no coffee for a while, but we drunk four cups afterwards. But he's sitting there. And uh, oh, what a picture of misery. And he says, I'm lost. I said, you are? How do you know? The Bible says it. I said, the same Bible that says that you're lost tells you how you can be saved. And I told him a simple story about Calvary, the love of Christ. And he's sitting there. Is that all it is? That's all. Everything was done at Calvary. It's not seven. I don't believe in seven steps to heaven. You know, a man was anxious in Ireland. He went to see a preacher. And he said, I would like to be saved. Well, he says, there's seven things you have to do. He came to see me. I said, the man shouldn't be preaching. If I had any power, I'd take away his letter. But I have no power to do it. Imagine telling an anxious soul seven things to do to get to heaven. My Bible says one thing. What is it? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. First time? Yes, first time. Every time I look at that boy in the assembly there sitting in Eglinton Avenue, I thank God for the day I went to the donut shop and asked the Lord that I might get another phone call tomorrow and the next and never get any more. That's the only time I point a man to Christ in a donut shop and eat donuts with him afterwards. The Spirit of God sending this man out into the desert. And as he ran to the chariot, he said, I wonder what he'll say to him. And as he ran to the chariot, he heard the sweetest words, words that we love, words that we love to preach from and words that we have loved to read before we went to break bread, Isaiah 53, the most versatile, the most blessed passage in the Old Testament, and he's reading, he was led as a lamb to the slaughter. Isn't that lovely? A sheep before his shears is dumb, so it went out his mouth. And as he drew near to the chariot and heard him read it, he knew that God was dealing. The Spirit was working. This is a vital matter now. This is the great salvation for this man. As he drew near, he didn't say to him, if you fall out of the chariot, you'll go to hell. No, no. You know, we need to know how to approach people. I was asked to give lectures to young men how to preach the gospel. The first thing I taught them was this, how to approach the public. Some people approach them the wrong way. Turn them away. Understandest thou what thou readest? Do you know what you're reading about? How can I? I need a man to guide me. And he said to Philip, would you like to come up into my chariot and sit beside me? No racial distinction here. If you're going to preach the gospel, it doesn't matter to me whether a man is yellow, red, or pink. Whatever he is, he's a sinner. I love to sit down beside a sinner anywhere in this wide world, whether it's in a jail, whether it's wherever it may be. He's a lost soul. God loves him. Not a man in the world, but God loves him. I'm one of those that believe that when he died on Calvary, he made provision for the whole wide world. Not a sinner on the way to hell, but can be saved tonight. Not one. I have no time for this people preaching election and saying you can't be saved unless you're one of the elect. It's not the gospel. We rejoice in God's sovereignty, but we believe that man is a free will agent and the gospel is for him. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I've done that all my life. Whether it was in a barn on a hillside or by a stream, wherever it was, preach Christ crucified, buried and risen again. 
the only remedy for sin. Understandest thou what thou readest? How can I? The place of the script you read was this. He's led as a lamb to the slaughter. And the man said to Philip, Who is this man? This wounded man. Wounded for me. When I was a boy, there used to be a man from Cambridge University. He came every year to the holiday resort where my father took us on our holiday in the summer. He was the founder of the Christian Mission for Children. And he was like what our brother Seal was. He, I really enjoyed that children's meeting. You should all have been here for it. It's like the second blessing that preaching that lad did today. I want to tell him. I, when a man pleases me and pleases and pleases me and he's preaching, I tell him. I like him. I like his way. And so this man preached to children. And this, I was went to that place a few weeks ago and stood there and thought when I was a boy of six and my brother was four and we're sitting there listening and this man came with a Cambridge blazer on him. His name was W.G. Ovens, and he said, I have authored a, a chorus I'm going to teach you. And we're sitting in the sand, and he sang, Wounded for me, wounded for me. There on the cross, he was wounded for me. Gone my transgressions, and now I am free, all because Jesus was wounded for me. Never forgot it. The night I was saved, I thought of the day at the sand. When I learned the chorus, it was the first time I realized he was wounded for me. When I was 19 years of age, <coughs> wounded for me. He was wounded for our transgressions. And I realized that on Calvary he was wounded. And I went back to that place. Now I was an old man. I stood there and thought of the day I learned the chorus, wounded for me. Wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. Christ was in the story. What good's a story without Christ? What's a conversion without knowing that he died on the cross for me? And so as he read the scripture and preached unto him Jesus, sweetest name on earth, the Savior's love, a home above. You know what happened now? The simplicity, the sincerity of the man's faith. He must have preached baptism along with his gospel. Now, one of the ways I differ from great fundamental evangelists, they leave baptism out of their preaching. I've preached baptism everywhere I go along with the gospel. The way you confess it is in the waters of baptism. I ran into great difficulties with it sometimes. One time in Cookstown, a woman got saved on Sunday morning. And on Sunday afternoon, she came to the door and said, I want to be baptized. Well, I, I said, uh, I don't know whether I can do it today when she says, this is the Lord's day. Well, I said, uh, you don't understand. She says, I understand rightly. You want to talk to the brethren about it, and they won't have me. And yet I'm a believer. I said, do you believe with all your heart? She says, I do. I said, okay. And so I went down to the hall, and I said, fill the tank. You're going to have a meeting with the brethren? No, I'm having no meeting with the brethren. I'm going to baptize a woman in that tank in her own confession of faith today. And the brethren said, well, it's very unusual. I said, I'm an unusual body anyway. Well, we've got to do it. I can't refuse her. Well, I said, if you think it's right, then we'll all agree. I said, thank God. Receive her next Sunday too. You announce her on Wednesday night. The best thing to do. That's what happened to me. I applied for fellowship. Well, they asked me. Going out, they said, would you like to be in fellowship here and break bread? I said, I'd love to. When? Whenever you, whenever you please. Well, um, would you like to see us today? I would. Wednesday night, come the prayer meeting. We'll announce you. And you'll be receiving Lord's Day morning. There were other people sitting back. Some of them sat until they were starving in the back seat. Nobody wanted them. You know, I count a great honor. The brethren were kind to me. And I've always believed a man wants to be baptized. Mr. Bentley knows when I was sitting in a cafe there in Balamina a couple of years ago, 
A man came in with his collar turned the wrong road. He was a Presbyterian clergyman, the largest church in, in Northern Ireland, a thousand members. And he came and sat down. He says, you know, when I was a boy, I used to hear you preach. It made me tremble. I got saved, he said. I have the largest congregation here. But he said, there's something troubling me. I need to be baptized. You do? Yes. I said, when? Well, whenever it can be arranged. I said, what about this afternoon? Down the hall on Cambridge Avenue. He said, have you authority? I said, yes, there's always water there. And I'm in Ballymena. I can do what I please here. I want to baptize you. You know, get it done. He began to draw back. Fear of man. Lose his position. This eunuch says, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? One thing, if you're not a believer, no place for you. But if thou believest with all thine heart, it is lawful. Thou mayest. And they went down both into the water. I have had the great privilege of going down into the water. Two men asked me to go back 48 years in memory. Three weeks ago, we traveled away to the borders of Ireland and over the border climbed a fence and into the, the, the river Finn. And I went to the place where the cattle went down to drink water. And I said, boys, this is the place. One of them was 78, the other one 71. One a servant of Christ and the other man was the head man in the police force before he retired. And I said, no, this is the spot. Do you see those boulders lying there in the water? Yes, I laid them there. I dammed that river with my own hands. 48 years, the big stones are still there. And I put sods down. And I asked nobody anything. It was away in the wilds. And I said to each of them, do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior? I asked them both. And I said, thou mayest. And I led them down into that dark, ugly place. You know, one of those men stood with the tears in his eyes. And he looked down, Harold, did you take us down into that hole there? I said, I took you down into that hole through the muck. And we got down into the place and I said, I put plenty of water in it. Didn't believe in sprinkling in those days. And I put me down into that hole. And we stood there on the banks of the river. And we sang, O happy day that fixed my choice. On thee, my Savior, and my God. And the three of us wept. And their sons stood weeping as they watched it. One of the sons said to me, I never saw the like of this in all my life. Forty-eight years since we stood at that river before. We're there. Again, to rededicate ourselves as old men to the love of Christ, to the meaning of baptism, the reality of following the Lord Jesus in a dark world like this. Thou mayest. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he buried him, raised him up, and the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, but the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. If you were saved tonight, you'd leave the conference another way. You'd go down the road happy that Christ is your Savior. Hell will never be your doom. It's a quarter past eight. Mr. Vance told me I could close at a quarter past eight. I'm obeying the brethren. Shall we pray?